So now, today's webinar, again, called entitled Using the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging to Understand the Role of Mobility Testing and Fall Risk Assessment for Community Dwelling Ad Adults. I'd like to introduce our speakers today, Dr. Marla Beauchamp and Dr. Aisha Kuspinar. Um, and just uh, quickly a little bit about them. Dr. Beauchamp is a physical therapist and assistant professor in the School of Rehab Science at McMaster. Her research focuses on rehabilitation strategies to enhance mobility among older adults, as well as those with chronic disease. She is particularly interested in advancing evidence-based practice in fall risk assessment and prevention in, in older adults. And Dr. Aisha Kuspinar is a physiotherapist and assistant professor in the School of Rehab Science at McMaster. Her research focuses on monitoring health outcomes that are important to people with chronic diseases and older adults, including symptoms, function, of, function and quality of life, the development of new tools using modern me measurement methods, as well as reliability and validity testing of existing tools. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to them. So thank you very much, Jennifer, for having us. Uh, we're happy to be here today. So we are talking today about um, the uh, mobility test for fall risk assessment and community dwelling older adults. We'll start with some uh, background on falls and the importance of uh, mobility and balance for fall, uh, for fall risk prediction. We'll go through um, quickly some fall risk assessment and, pre and prevention guidelines, and then we'll share with you the results from our CLSA analysis, uh, looking at different mobility tests and um, their predictive um, accuracy for falls, um, and then we'll talk about clinical uh, and research implications of our findings. So why are we here today talking about falls? Um, falls are arguably one of the most costly and important public health concerns facing older adults. They're the leading cause of injury-related hospitalization among older adults. When an older adult is hospitalized because of a fall, it's associated with the longest length of stay compared to all other causes. Just in direct healthcare costs alone, Falls cost the Canadian healthcare system $3.3 billion every year. And at an individual level, falls lead to this downward spiral of activity restriction, a further increase in risk of falls, long-term care admission, and, and uh, mortality. And with the um, aging population expected to increase, um, the, the, these numbers um, are projected to increase as well. So given the devastating consequences of falls, it's not surprising that a lot of the literature has been devoted to identifying risk factors for falls. In this very uh, well-known paper by Tanetti and, and Kumar and JAMA, we can see that after a history of a previous fall, a balance impairment is the second most commonly identified uh, risk factor for falling. And the good news is, is that contrary to what this comic suggests, is that we actually know that falls can be prevented. So there are a number of systematic reviews, meta-analyses, um, and clinical trials that have shown that if we identify people that are at risk um, and we provide them with a targeted fall prevention intervention, we can reduce both the rate and the risk of falls by up to 40%. And uh, what types of interventions have the most benefit? Well, consistently, it's exercise programs um, are emerge as the main component of fall prevention um, interventions. And in particular, it's functional exercises that challenge balance that has the greatest impact on falls. So again, the importance of balance and mobility is, is highlighted here. So fall prevention guidelines have been uh, produced by a number of different organizations. Probably the most common um, is the AGS-BGS, so that's the guideline put forward by the American and British Geriatric Societies. There's also the NICE guideline from the UK, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, and the Centers for Disease Control um, Steady Algorithm, Stopping Elderly Accidents, Deaths, and Injuries. And in each of those guidelines, um, tests of, of balance and mobility are recommended as part of first-level fall risk screening. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to advance the slide. Oh, 
Okay. So here's a uh, simplified uh, algorithm, which uh, instead of going through each of those uh, guidelines separately, we thought we'd show you a synthesis of the, of the guidelines. So essentially, when an, a healthcare provider encounters an older adult, uh, and it's defined typically as someone over the age of 65, the healthcare provider should be asking that uh, person, have you had a fall in the last year, or do you feel unsteady with standing or walking? If you answer yes to either of those key questions, if the patient, sorry, answers yes to either of those key questions, then a, um, the health provider is um, recommended to conduct a balance and mobility screening test to determine whether or not that participant has a high risk of falls. If performance on that screening test is uh, above the cutoff or deemed to not be impaired, the person is not is considered to either be at lower risk or medium risk, and they're edu they receive education and referral to community exercise. If performance on that balanced screening test is below the cutoff or deemed to be impaired, then a more detailed uh, um, balance assessment and assessment of other fall risk factors um, should follow, followed by targeted fall prevention uh, interventions. So looking at this guideline, one of the questions that, um, that is raised is really, well, which test do we use to do the balance and mobility screening test and, and at what cutoff? And one consideration um, is certainly that we need to have short, easy to administer tests um, that make sense in terms and to be used for screening. And when we look at the, the different clinical practice guidelines, a number of different tests are suggested by each but only one of them actually includes cutoff values to identify people that are impaired. So in the CDC study algorithm, a 12-second uh, cutoff on the time, death, and go is recommended to identify people at risk of falling. In that same guideline, cutoffs are also suggested for um, the optional standing balance test and chair stand test that are also recommended in this guideline. However, a problem uh, with these endorsed cutoffs is that there's really limited research uh, to support um, using them. Uh, we, often the study uh, sample sizes are small or based on a convenient sample, and in some cases um, they're based on uh, studies where falls are not the primary outcome. So the aim of our study, um, our analysis today, was to determine the accuracy and cutoff values of commonly used screening tests of balance and mobility for predicting falls in community dwelling older adults who are enrolled in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. <clears throat> so to answer a research um, question, we use the CLSA comprehensive cohort uh, baseline data. And the CLSA is really the largest research platform of its kind in Canada and which and follows 50,000 people between the ages of 45 to 85 at baseline over a 20-year period. So for our study, for this project, we performed a secondary analysis of, our, um, of the baseline and the 18-month follow-up data <clears throat> from the CLSA comprehensive cohort. And to be in line with clinical practice guidelines, our inclusion criteria were that participants had to be older than 65 years old, um, they had to report an injury due to a fall in the past 12 months um, at baseline or report difficulty with mobility uh, during activities of daily living, such as walking, transferring, <clears throat> mobility around the community, shopping, or housework. So in the CLSA, uh, falls at baseline is captured by first asking participants the following question. So in the past 12 months, have you had any injuries that were serious enough to limit some of your normal activities? For example, a broken bone or a bad cut or burn. Participants who answer yes to this question are then asked, was this injury caused by a fall? So those who answer yes, this injury was caused by a fall, and whether the fall was from the same level or from a height, were recorded as having a fall at baseline in our analysis. Our outcome was 
falls at approximately 18 months after baseline assessment, which was collected through the maintaining contact questionnaire that's administered by, by phone. So for the follow-up question, participants were asked, we are interested in falls where you hurt yourself enough to limit some of your normal activity. In the past 12 months, did you have any falls? If they answered yes to this question, they were recorded as having any fall in our analysis, so one or more falls. And a subsequent question was, how many times have you fallen in the past 12 months? And we recorded the, the number of uh, times the fall occurred was recorded, and if it was two or more times, this was recorded as multiple falls in our analysis. Our exposure variables in, were poor mobility and balance tests um, found in the ba uh, comprehensive cohort at baseline. So we had the timed up and go, or tug, uh, standing balance test, which is also known as the single leg stance test, chair rise test, and gait speed. I'm going to go through each one in a bit more detail in, in the next slide. So the timed up and go test, or, or the tug, involves participants getting up from a chair, walking three meters, turning around, walking back, and sitting down in the chair at their usual pace. It is really um, the most widely suggested test by clinical practice guidelines. But the problem is that the data to support the recommended cutoff, as Marla mentioned earlier, of 12 seconds is weak. The 12 second cutoff was actually based on a study that looked at the ability of the tug to discriminate between community dwelling and institutionalized older adults, rather than falls as an outcome. Although other studies have validated this cutoff for falls with varying degrees of accuracy, um, a recent systematic review that specifically wanted to look at the predictive validity of, of the tug uh, for predicting falls in community dwelling older adults showed incons inconsistent results and where um, accuracy or area under the curve values ranged from 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. And many of the studies had actually uh, were limited by their small size, sample sizes. Our, the next test uh, that we, we used in our analysis was the standing balance test. So this asks uh, participants are asked to stand on one leg for up to 60 seconds. And the maximum amount of time that they're able to hold that position is recorded. So being able to hold that tandem or single leg standing position for less than 10 seconds is suggested as the cutoff value for fall risk. Again, um, there are actually no prospective cohort studies that have really looked at this threshold value, and, and the studies that have assessed it have reported low accuracy with area under the curve values of less than 0.6. Our third test is the chair rise test. Um, this involves participants standing up from a chair, then sitting back down five times, and the time it takes to complete this task is recorded. There's some evidence for uh, the predictive validity of this test for falls, but its accuracy has not yet been reported, and, and as, a, as a result of this, there are no established uh, cutoff values or AUC values reported to date on, on this test. And last, uh, or, but not least, definitely, is the gait speed test um, in the CLSA, which is actually referred to as the timed four meter walk test in, um, in the CLSA. So for this, participants are, are instructed to walk at their usual pace until they pass the four meter um, finish line located. Uh, uh, just uh, four meters away, and that, in fact, studies to date have shown that incons there are inconsistent results for predicting falls, and one study, interestingly, showed that the relationship between gait speed and falls may actually be nonlinear. For our analysis, we looked at the area under the curve of the receiver operating characteristic curve, 
um, to analyze our data. And the AUC would allow us to really determine the accuracy of each of these screening tests in terms of how well they could distinguish between fallers and non-fallers. The optimal cutoff value was selected based on maximizing sensitivity and specificity um, at, at 18 months. And our outcomes were any falls, so one or more falls, or multiple falls. So two or more falls, and we considered an AUC value of 0.7 to be acceptable. Okay, so this flow chart here shows how our sample was selected. So the comprehensive cohort includes 12,646 uh, people who are over the age of 65 years old at baseline. And among this cohort, we almost 11,000 older ha adults had no falls or mobility limitations at baseline, based on our, our criteria and the questions we looked at, which left a, uh, 1,719 older adults for inclusion. But we wanted to ensure that there was at least 12 months of uh, time interval or between the baseline assessment and the follow-up question uh, or the maintaining contact question at approximately, which should be around 18 months. So if there were individuals who were assessed at, for the maintaining contact questionnaire uh, before this 12-month time period, we excluded those, those um, individuals. This left us about 1,121 participants for, for inclusion in our um, analysis. And among these uh, individuals, 419 reported having a baseline fall, um, 646 reported having some form of mobility limitation in, uh, based on uh, walking and the questions from the activities of daily living questionnaire, and 56 individuals reported having both a fall and a mobility limitation. And if we look at, uh, in here, interestingly, for each of these groups, uh, there were met more women, uh, ranging from about 58 to 72 percent, uh, than, than men, which was about from 30 to 42 percent. Okay, uh, so our sample uh, shown in this table, so our, our total sample was 1,121 individuals, and of which 67%, so 747, were women, while we had only 374 men that were included in our, in our study. In general, we, we see a trend here that more women had four or more chronic conditions than men. Um, and de depressive symptoms, uh, on average, we could see that more women reported having depressive symptoms than, uh, than men um, with lower education level and uh, lower income compared to men. In addition, we also uh, can see here that more women reported moderate or severe pain and slightly higher meds, uh, med use for depression. For the baseline performance on the test, our results were actually um, consistent with what we would expect in a community dwelling older adult sample. Our mean was around 11 seconds for the timed up and go test, uh, about 0 0.86 to 0 0.88 meters per second for gait speed. Um, balance was ranged from 24 to 28 seconds, and chair rise was about 15 seconds. And we could see that as expected, in those who were 75 years and older, performance on these tests worsened. Um, and in addition, some of these tests showed 
more of a difference between men and women. So, for example, if we look at the single leg stand, test uh, in women, we see on average about nine seconds, while in men, it was 15 seconds. So our, our, our outcome at 18 months, which um, one of our outcomes, which was any fall in the past 12 months, if we look at the slide here, we see that the rates in this sample were fairly similar across men and women about 19 to 20%, which makes sense given that these individuals all had either a previous fall or a mobility problem. And in this slide here, we're looking at multiple falls. Uh, so uh, our other outcome at 18 months, and 58 out of 747 women, so 7.8%, uh, reported two or more falls, and 26 out of 374, or 7% of men, reported two or more falls. And because we had less men in our sample in total, uh, you can see that the absolute number of falls for men by age strata was small, with only 12 repeated falls in 65 plus and 14 in the 75 plus group for men. So in line with current guidelines, our first step was to really analyze our data or our findings um, with men and women combined and all older adults above the 65-year-old uh, together. So we found that, and as we can see in this table here, that none of the tests actually predicted one or more falls with acceptable accuracy. And our AUC values ranged from 0.5, which is no better than chance, um, to 0.6 uh, for, for the tug, which that, that was the highest AUC value or area under the curve value that we were able to see. And in, in this table, where when we looked at uh, multiple falls or um, repeat fallers, the accuracy of the test improved um, slightly with the tug achieving um, an area under the curve value of 0.68 and gait speed falling close behind at 0.65. And here are the um, ROC curves uh, for, for multiple falls. So the tug had um, identified multiple fallers with a cutoff of, we have a cutoff or threshold value of 13.7 seconds. And for gait speed, we uh, have the cutoff of 0 0.73 meters per, per second when we look at the entire sample uh, together. So next, we conducted age and sex stratified analyses, and we were able to do that because of the large sample size um, in the CLSA. So if we start by looking at women, and we're looking at, in this table, at predictive accuracy for any falls. So these are women that reported one or more falls. On the top, we see um, women aged 65 to 74 years old, and on the bottom are for the women um, 75 plus. And we can see the AUC values, again, similar to when we uh, combine, combine the sample together, the AUC values are um, fairly low, uh, with the t highest AUC of uh, 0.6 being achieved by the time death and go, and, um, and the same in the 75-plus um, category. What is interesting to note is when we look at the model that includes other fall risk factors, so the models that include um, depression, cognition, vision, education, uh, pain, uh, use of psychotropic medications. Um, when we look at that model, the AUCs actually improve to acceptable levels. So this suggests that when uh, thinking about predicting one or more falls um, in women, um, we may need to think about other risk factors. Now looking at the predictive accuracy for multiple falls in women, so these are women that reported two or more falls at 18-month follow-up, um, we see a little bit of a different story. So now in women aged 65 to 74 years old, 
the time that can go um, now achieves our acceptable accuracy level of, um, of 0 0.70 in terms of the AUC. The sensitivity um, at the cutoff value um, that optimized sensitivity and specificity was 52%, uh, so a little bit low, um, and specificity was 88%. The positive predictive value was 29%, and the negative predictive value was uh, 95%. So uh, the tests are really able, um, this test seems to be able to uh, be able to rule out people um, uh, better than, than rule them in. In terms of looking at the model that includes other risk factors, again, the AUCs improve when we include other risk factors in the model. Looking at women over the age of 75, again, the timed up and go had the best accuracy with um, an AUC value of 0.7. Here the sensitivity has improved to 70% um, at a slight cost to specificity at 64%. The positive predictive value was 14% and the negative predictive value was 96% uh, here. Um, it's interesting also that gate speed, although it doesn't reach our cutoff of uh, 0.7, it, does, it did come pretty close with a AUC of, of 0.68 in women 75 plus. So these are the uh, ROC curves for the timed up and go for identifying multiple fallers in women. On the left-hand side uh, is, the, um, our, is the curve for women ages, age 65 to 74, and on the right-hand side is for those uh, 75 plus, and so both had the AUC of 0.7. Um, the cutoff score for the timed up and go in women age 65 to 74 was 14.1 seconds. And this was the cutoff that, opt that maximized both sensitivity and specificity. And the cutoff score in women aged 75 and over was 12.9 seconds. Looking at the now looking at the predictive accuracy for one or more falls in men, we see a similar um, trend to what we had observed in women. So in uh, men 65 to 74 years old, the AUC values in general uh, were, were um, below what um, we would consider to be acceptable. So as little as chance with 0 0.50 to as, um, the highest accuracy in the uh, 65 to 74 uh, category being achieved by actually the single leg um, balance test in this case. And um, then in the 75 plus, um, we have the timed up and go um, is, is achieving the best um, accuracy, but still well below um, what we would consider um, acceptable at 0.63. Again, here, it's, it's really important to note that when we include other risk factors in the models, our AUC values do improve to, to what would, we would consider to be um, acceptable for screening. Looking at now at the predictive accuracy for multiple falls in men, um, in this case we have um, balance, single leg balance, being the test that has a very high AUC with um, an AUC of 0 0.85. Um, the, cut, the cutoff score identified was 3.6 seconds and that had 88% sensitivity and 83% specificity, so pretty good. Um, the positive predictive value was 24% and the negative predictive value was 99%. What's interesting, if we keep kind of looking along that row, if we look at the model that has other risk factors included, we are, um, uh, we are able to get very good, um, if not in some cases near close to perfect discrimination when we add other risk factors. In men 75 and older, we none of the tests have um, high accuracy for identifying um, fallers uh, or multiple fallers, um, and the confidence intervals are quite wide. What is interesting is, again, when we look at, that, at those models that have the other risk factors, the AUC values in some cases go up um, to, to quite high. So these are the ROC curves um, for multiple fallers in men. And on the left-hand side is the one for um, single leg stance or, or the uh, balance, standing balance test. In the middle is the uh, time up and go. And on the right is the gate speed. And we've included the tug and the gate speed here because they were the other 
two tests that, that had um, the, the second and third best accuracy for identifying multiple fallers in men. Um, and so one thing to notice here is that, uh, again, because we had a smaller number of men that met our inclusion criteria for in, um, including inclusion into this sample, the number of fall events was lower. Um, and so that's why the curves are not as smooth here as in the um, other ROC curves that we showed. But the cutoff score that we identified um, on balance in men was 3.6 seconds. For time depth and go, it was 11.7 seconds, and for gait speed, it was 0.85 meters per second. So overall, um, we think that these findings raise um, a, a few different, um, I have some, some key messages. So firstly, none of the uh, mobility and balance screening tests were able to predict one or more falls at 18 months. Um, and this is, this is a notable considering that we included in, uh, within the CLSA, we have a lot of the commonly, commonly used and commonly recommended tests for doing balance and mobility screening. Um, and this might suggest that we, we may need to consider um, different balance tests or different mobility tests that either have a higher difficulty level or include more items or ch that challenge more different aspects of balance and these might have higher accuracy. But of course, there is going to be a trade-off between complexity of a test and um, feasibility for using it in screening. In addition, um, because our AUC values, um, especially in the Asian sex stratified analyses, tended to improve when we uh, considered, when we added other fall risk factors in the model, this suggests we might want to think about con considering a fall risk index in future work that takes into account some of these other risk factors. Our results did show that we were able to identify those who were at the highest risk for repeat falls. So we were able to um, identify, um, identify those high-risk people w with the uh, mobility um, and balance screening tests. And really importantly, the optimal cutoff values and the predictive accuracy for the test were different for men versus women, and they were also different across age groups. And we believe this has important implications for fall risk assessment and prevention guidelines, um, which um, to date haven't really considered uh, sex or age in their recommendations. So getting back to the question, which test is best? Well, the answer um, is, is, not, um, is, is not necessarily uh, just one test. In women, the timed up and go had the best accuracy for predicting multiple falls in our study. And, it, and again, the cutoff value was depended a little bit on age. So 65 to 74, the timed up and go score was 14.1 seconds that identified people with multiple falls. And in women aged 75 to, um, plus, the timed up and go uh, score was 12.9 seconds to identify people with two or more, more falls. And in men, the single leg balance test really had the best accuracy for predicting multiple falls with a cutoff value of um, less than um, 3.6 seconds as identifying those with two or more falls. Uh, if we look at the timed up and go scores um, cutoff that um, identified men with multiple falls, it was 11.7 seconds. And I think it's just really interesting to look at how these uh, timed up and go cutoffs change um, by looking at um, versus looking at women, looking at men, and then looking at across the age group. Um, and you see that they're all, um, if we were to go with the, the 12 second cutoff um, that's currently recommended by the CDC, it, it doesn't necessarily capture some of this um, complexity. So some limitations of, of our study is um, certainly that the wording of the fall, uh, the questions around falls and mobility were um, different than um, in, in the fall prevention guidelines. So um, that's important to note. We did have, um, as we said, a smaller sample size um, in men, so fewer fall events. And in particular, um, more, I think we need more research in men uh, 75 years and older because in that group it appeared that falls um, could be predicted by factors other than balance and mobility. 
In addition, um, it's possible individuals who were at the highest risk of falls may have been less likely to attend an in-person assessment um, at baseline in the, in the CLSA. And um, participants with worse balance or mobility may have been contraindicated to perform the test or may not have performed the test as part of, as part of the study. So um, we, have, we may have um, some, some missing data related to that. Conclusions um, based on our findings are that um, our results are consistent in showing differences um, between age, uh, differences by age and by sex in terms of the predictive value of the mobility screening test. And I think this is um, an important consideration for clinical practice guidelines. Uh, future, re future work should also evaluate other screening tests um, or a fall risk index that would incorporate other uh, fall risk factors. And um, prospective studies that are, have been designed to explicitly answer questions about fall risk screening um, would be uh, ideal to, to be able to draw definitive conclusions. And we're excited to be um, starting one of these um, studies very shortly. So uh, we just want to acknowledge the co-authors um, on this project. Dr. Parmandarina, uh, who is the lead PI of the CLSA, Sohel Nazmul, who is um, our, our statistician, Lauren Griffiths and Alexandra Mayhu for their um, support, and then the, the funders for the CLSA. And actually, um, both um, Sohel and Parminder are in the room with us today, so they may type in to help us um, answer some questions. So thanks very much. Great. Well, I will. Uh sort of take over from here and uh, help moderate the question and answer period. Um, thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, again, I'd like to open it up to questions. I know a few of you have already posted a few in the chat box, so thank you very much. We'll start with those. Um, just a reminder that the muting will remain on, but you can enter your question straight into the chat box that's in the bottom right-hand corner of the WebEx window. So we'll start with the first question. I'll just uh, stop start from the top, and if uh, um, if either uh, Dr. Kosminar or Dr. Beauchamp want to just sort of filter the questions on their own, that's fine, or else I'll just make sure we address them all. So the first question is related to the CLSA as a whole, and that is, what is the proportion of women in the CLSA sample as a whole? Um, I don't know if do you both know that offhand, or I could probably speak to it, or... 51%, that's what I thought it was, so thank mm -hmm. you, Parminder. Um, so it's just over, uh, I think it's exactly 51 or just slightly over that. Um, so it's, it's comparable. Mm -hmm. The next question is, why were, why were the MCQ less than six months and six to 11 months excluded? I think you might have touched on this, but maybe mm -hmm. um, if you can explain that again. Well, our outcome was uh, falls at, eight, at 18 months. Um, using the maintaining contact questionnaire. And that the question, um, the maintaining contact question asks participants to recall falls that they have had in the last 12 months that were serious enough to limit some of their normal activities. And because we're asking people to think back um, to a 12-month re recall period, we wanted to make sure that that uh, question was administered at least 12 months after their baseline assessment. Great, thanks for clarifying. Uh, the next question is uh, one of the few from the uh, Ashok. Um, am I correct in inferring that all your models were stratified by gender and age groups while controlling for demographic variables like education, depression, scores, income, et cetera? So, so we, yeah, we, we looked at we looked at the um, the data by just looking um, at the the test on their own. So not controlling or um, including any other variables in the model. So in our tables on, on one side, you can see that it was just um, based on what are the cutoff values for these tests on their own for different gender and age groups. And then on, on the other side of the table, we had um, models that included other demographic variables, and, and we did. And those were ones like uh, education, uh, depression, um, income was not included, uh, pain, and um, medication use for, for depression. Yeah. So, um, we, so we had both. We looked at the, the data both ways. 
So the first data that we went through was all the data combined, so looking at people over the age of 65 um, and men and women combined, and then the other analyses we presented were um, separately for women and men and, and also stratified by age. Okay, the next question is also about models. Uh, did your models include the sampling weights of the CLSA? And if so, can you mention which sampling weights were used since I know that the CLSA has various sample weight variables? So fortunately, I think uh, mm. we might, uh, Sohel might know that answer or so, Provinder or? <laughs> so we did, we did not use sampling weights yeah. for this analysis, but I'm, I'm not sure if anyone wants to comment any more um, on that. But. Initially, we decided to not to use weight, uh, and because it's a subsample for the specifically for the baseline follower only, uh, that's why we did not test it whether the sample will be, uh, weight will be valid or not for this case. So we we definitely we can uh, test it later on to see whether we can use the weight or not. Basically, uh, with, if we would have used the analytical weight specifically for this analysis, the way we have subselected the sample, those weights wouldn't have been valid. In order to use the weights, we would have to recalibrate those weights to uh, come up with a valid analytical weight. And that was the, rather than doing that, we went with unweighted uh, analysis. Great, thank you. Okay, the next question uh, is, was there a test for men aged 75 to 85? So in that uh, age group, uh, none, of the, none of the tests had um, acceptable, um, what we would consider to be acceptable accuracy for identifying either one or more falls or multiple fallers. Um, but we did, um, what we, I think, I think the timed up and go, if I'm, if I'm remembering, yeah. Um, the time gap and go probably had the best um, AUC in that group. It was statistically significant. The AUC was 0 0.63. But um, when we when we looked at um, the models adjusted or not adjusted the, the models that included other fall risk factors, um, those we were able to predict um, both one or more falls and multiple falls with with much better accuracy. So I think, um, in terms of this sample of men over the age of six, uh, over the age of 75, um, we probably need to look at tests um, beyond um, balance and mobility, or uh, and, and really think about other risk factors. And that's sort of what what um, had us um, thinking about, you know, potentially doing a fall risk index um, and future work that would incorporate um, some other risk factors. But generally, the challenge for that age group was. Even with a large sample size in Canada, so we had very few people in the oldest, men, mm -hmm. the oldest male group. Mm -hmm. So to do really valid analysis, probably we'll have to wait for the longitudinal data to accrue more events to be able to look at that population. Yes, exactly. Okay. So the next question is, am I correct in inferring that the cutoffs were also a parameter of interest that was estimated in your models? Lots of good questions about the models. Um, I'm not sure I, I fully understand the question, but the, the, in, in terms of the models that included the other risk factors, we would have included the cutoff value that was identified um, with the, on its own that maximized sensitivity and specificity for the outcome, and that cutoff value would have been included in the, in the model that had the other risk factors. Um, is that... Sorry? Does anyone else have anything to add? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, let's see if we can. Okay, next question is uh, pulling in the idea of uh, cognition. Um, so, how is cognition accounted for, and mm -hmm. how do we know that participants were actually able to recall the falls that they had? Well, we, we don't. <laughs> We don't know. We know there is. We know that. Um, we certainly know that recall bias is can be a problem when asking uh, participants to uh, recall over the over a 12 month period, um, and typically that results in an underestimation of of the number of falls that people report. 
Um, in terms of uh, cognition, I mean, we have adjusted for it using um, the mental alteration test in our, in the, not adjusted, we have included um, people that were, um, we have included cognition, sorry, as a factor in our um, models that include other fall risk factors. Um, but we didn't, um, we did not have any exclusion criteria related to um, cognition at baseline. Um, and in, in general, um, um, I, I... So, and if we, um, based on our sample, um, our characteristics at, at baseline, just looking at um, the MAT or mental alteration test, and those who were below um, less than 35, which is the cutoff for some uh, cognitive um, deficits, there were it was about uh, eight to nine percent of our sample. So majority um, had higher scores on on this test, mm -hmm. uh, but definitely you do bring up a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we still have another at least another 10 minutes for questions, but I just want to remind anyone who. Um, does need to leave early to complete the survey. Um, that was just, uh, should have just popped up on your screens um, before you go. So thank, thanks for doing that for us. Um, now we'll just go to the next question, which is, um, can you comment on whether underreporting of falls could be occurring and whether it might differ by gender, age, or other characteristics? And also, how might this influence the findings? Um, so definitely under-reporting of falls um, was probably likely to have, have occurred, um, be, just because we are asking people to recall back um, 12 months, and studies that have examined um, recall, um, recall bias have, have um, shown that um, it can result in an underestimation of the number of falls. And... Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is, is that we the wording of the falls question um, at the, the um, at the maintaining contact questionnaire is really um, talking about falls where you hurt yourself enough to limit some of your normal activities. So again, here um, we're asking people to recall um, serious falls or more major falls. So it means that some um, falls that were less memorable um, may not have been reported. Um, so in general, we think that that um, it would be an underestimation. Um, and so uh, obviously if we had had more fall events, it's possible that um, it's possible that our um, um, accuracy, it's possible that our AUC values were um, underestimated, um, but it's hard to say for sure. Anything to add on that? Uh, we also just have a kind note to say thank you very much for answering all my questions. Great presentation and research work. Thanks to all the authors for this work. Um, I might just open it up to anyone who, who's here in the room right now just to ask if there's anything else you wanted to add to the presentation or respond to um, in terms of any of the questions. No, I think I think just I think the take home um, from our results is, is not that we're saying necessarily that these are the the cutoff values that that we need to be um, you know that we need to uh, be using now. It's it's the point that we probably need to start thinking about age and sex um, specific um, um, uh, cutoff uh, fall risk assessment um, criteria because our results do consistently no matter which way. And no matter which um, analysis we looked at, do consistently show differences between men and women, um, and also differences by age. And I think that's important to consider. Um, so your presentation indicated that functional exercises that challenge balance have the greatest impact on falls. Um, there's a question: Could you give some examples of this? So, so. Um, so what we mean by this um, are, um, oh, so uh, basically the exercises need to be, um, as opposed to sitting down in a chair and doing strengthening, um, you have to be up, um, you have to be um, doing activities that you would do in your daily life. That's what we mean by functional. 
So, um, so that means you know walking. That means um, sitting, uh, sitting down in a chair and getting back up. Um, it means doing tasks that you do in your daily life and using that to train. Um, in terms of challenging balance during functional training, that means um, there's a number of different ways we can challenge balance, but um, by narrowing the base of support is one way. Um, by adding um, um, a dual task is another. Um, by making, um, by altering speed, by removing visual input, those are all ways that we can um, challenge balance while doing uh, functional exercises. So just, uh, I'll just add a, another question that I had is that um, obviously there's differences in, in sex amongst mm -hmm. the uh, results. Um, and you also mentioned um, implications in terms of this, in terms of uh, fall risk assessment guidelines. I'm wondering if you might be able to give some examples of what um, the implications of, of these differences might actually look like in clinical mm -hmm. practice within these guidelines. So a bit of a knowledge translation mm -hmm. question. I think, um, so in terms of clinical practice, I mean, what we, uh, as a clinician, you uh, cutoff values, and, and that's why we, it was one of our overall findings, is in, um, in terms of looking at, as a clinician, you would want to know, does my patient, is my patient over or um, above or under this cutoff value? So uh, it, it, it can tell you a lot in terms of, okay, who, who's coming in to see me, what is um, their current status, and then are they above or below this threshold, um, and are they at risk for falls? Right. So, and, and I think our results show that there is a trend um, that there, these values are different for men and women, and then that we need to assess accordingly and look at cutoff values separately for, for each one. So, what it might ultimately look like is just instead of just one cutoff value for everybody, it might be it might ultimately be you know for men of this age you know, we should use this test and at this cutoff value, and for women of this age, we should use this test at this, at this cutoff value. And obviously, um, trying to keep the messaging as simple as possible, but making sure that we're, um, you know, uh, providing as precise um, estimates as, as the, as, of the cutoff values as we can. Great. Well, it sounds like there's lots of opportunities to take this and uh, translate it into useful guidelines for clinicians like yourself. Um, whether it be in primary care or um, wherever the, our, these patients in the community are being seen. So I don't see any other questions, um, so maybe I'll wrap it up at this point. Um, feel free to uh, post any last questions while I go through the uh, closing of the webinar. Um, so again, thank you again for such a great presentation. Uh, we appreciate your presentation in the webinar series. I know this you, you've presented for us before, and it's, uh, again, greatly valued, and I know very people are very receptive to this topic. I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. Uh, the next deadline for applications is February 12th of 2020, which is only a few months away. Please visit the CLSA website under data access to review available data, um, obtain further information or details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete the survey that's located under the polling option. If you have any questions or concerns that uh, any of the team here at the CLSA can help with, please write to us in the chat box and we'd be happy to help. Um, our final webinar of 20. 19 will take place on December 16th with Dr. Ruth Barclay. Um, uh, yeah, Bar I wanted to make sure I said that right, Barclay. Um, she's an associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy at the uh, University of Manitoba. Uh, her presentation will be factors associated with community ambulation in older adults and those with stroke and osteoarthritis. So if you're interested in that webinar, we encourage you to register as soon as possible. Um, also, uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, um, for any of, of, of you that either have uh, students or postdocs, or if you are one, um, and you have an interest in longitudinal studies on aging, we encourage you to save the date for uh, what's called SPA 2020. This is an in innovative five-day training program that will t take place next June at Hockley Valley Resort in southwestern Ontario. More details can be found 
uh, will be available in January 2020 uh, when the program launches on CIHR's research net. Um, and remember, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar, and we invite you to follow us on Twitter at CLSA underscore ELCV. Um, and please go to our, web, our CLSA website to register for our webinar series again and join us for our upcoming webinars. And finally, thank you again for all of you for attending and for our presenters who also presented. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.